here. My name is Ryan Adams. I'm with the Center for IPM, um, a very unique and new position um, on C NC State's campus. Um, my background's kind of on the turf um, and lawn and landscape side of things. Um, and so kind of a little bit in my realm, but with this new position, it's kind of unique that I work across all disciplines in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. So still get to deal with turf and, and the lawn side of it, um, but get to deal with fruit crops, um, veggies, um, and even some of big ag such as soybean um, and cotton. And so it's really kind of unique. I'm learning <laughs> as much as possible every single day. Um, and so really wanted to kind of, you know, talk to you about IPM, you know, for your lawn and landscape, um, give you some examples and really kind of, you know, talk to you about some fundamental principles of IPM, the history of IPM. Um, but then again, using that experience and expertise and, you know, IPM is so much more about just thinking critically what you are doing um, in each moment. Um, so really thinking about using that experience and expertise to formulate a plan to make the best decision at that given time. And with IPM, you know, that changes on a day-to-day -day basis. So really focusing in, using all those resources and coming up with the best course of action. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to be focusing on today. So first kind of want to start what everybody kind of um, everybody here, and especially master gardeners and, and us at NC State, we're looking for, you know, sustainable is that big word. It's often overused, um, but it fits. You know, we're looking towards the future, and that's really what IPM is doing, is, you know, thinking about pest problems. So, you know, um, why is that pest there? Um, you know, promoting beneficials, um, promoting pollinators, you know. When it comes to pesticides, you know, looking, choosing that right pesticide, you know, for the environment, for human health, um, and also for cost benefits. Um, and so really thinking about all those different things um, and goes into a sustainable landscape. I think everybody would agree that this isn't necessarily a sustainable landscape or have IPM. Um, I do see some weeds growing in the crack in the front. Um, you know, when you think of IPM, you know, possibly some weed control there, but you also see the environmental negatives. You go out there and spray those weeds that are just coming through the cracks. Anything that doesn't hit that leaf surface or end up in that crack, or if there's rainfall event after, it's gonna end up where? It's gonna move down towards the street. It's gonna end up possibly in the street and then move into, um, move into the source system. And so, by no means, it, I think we could all agree that this is not optimal and this is not what we're looking for and we think of a sustainable, um, kind of uh, sustainable and environmentally friendly. All right, a little history on IPM. You know, IPM kind of started in the early 70s and we'll kind of get there through this, you know, very brief kind of history. Um, you know, DDT was, you know, kind of introduced in 1939, you know, kind of right before World War II um, and, you know, through those 10 years, and especially after World War II, you know, resistance was starting to be seen in the late 40s. Um, and through this process, you know, with DDT and the growth of pesticide industry um, just grew tremendously throughout the 40s and the 50s. Um, farmers, you know, a lot of practitioners, they saw it as a magic bullet. Um, they had a whole bunch of different pesticides that they never had access to to control pests, to protect their crops. Um, and they had just all these different options um, and they relied on them quite heavily because they always had that fallback. They always had that pesticide to be able to spray. Um, and really this picture does shows a lot of their uh, mentality. Um, it didn't matter what the pest was or how big the pest was. They had a wide array and very uh, several chemicals that they could turn to um, to get the job done. And, you know, that kind of methodology, while, you know, they were trying to protect their crops, you know, they, their goal obviously is to, you know, feed America, especially on your food side of it. Um, this magic bullet mindset kind of led to, you know, blanket applications, um, very self-reliant, very reliant on those pesticide usage. Um, and DDT, you know, um, just pictures, and I'm sure you might have seen them before, of just, you know, blanket application um, of pesticides to the environment was very, very common in the 40s and the 50s, such as DDT applications throughout cities, 
Um, as you can see kids in all these different pictures and it was just the time and the age. Um, did it do very good at controlling mosquitoes and other insects in the environment, um, in the public? It did, um, but at what risk? And this was really kind of called into action, um, especially by Rachel Carson um, in the 1960s. So, I mean, we went through about a decade phase, if not a little bit longer there, um, decade and a half where, you know, this was accepted that, you know, not many questions were asked. And Rachel Carson was one of the first ones to speak up in her book, Silent Spring, um, really asking the question, why are we doing this? Are we, you know, are we considering, is this the way that we really want to live? And um, a great book, just questioning. And that question is such a fundamental principle of IPM of why are we doing this? Um, about, you know, a decade later in the early 1970s, um, you know, after definitely some um, human, you know, movement um, and, and just a lot of vo people voicing their concerns, the USDA did kind of create a nationwide IPM program um, for all land grant universities across the United States. Um, from here at NC State to Iowa State to Michigan State to even out in the West. And the biggest three principles that they focused on were human health risks, the environmental health risks, and then the economics that go along with the adoption of IPM practices. And they put millions of dollars into these programs across the United States to really focus in and determining how are we affecting human health risks, environmental, and also um, economic uh, benefits of using IPM practices. IPM, um, just wanted to kind of do a rough, you know, start with IPM and do kind of a rough kind of overview. Um, majority of this, you know, it is in your booklet. Um, and then we'll kind of move into a little bit more advanced and, and really practicing of IPM. Um, IPM, you know, what I say, and I kind of already mentioned, is that experience, um, using that experience, using your education um, to really figure out a way um, economically and environmentally to manage pests within the landscape um, and across all of our food crops. Uh, and it's not to eliminate all pests. That was the goal 60, 70 years ago was to eliminate all pests, remove all uncertainty, remove all the elements that could cause a reduction in food crops, that could cause you know, a loss of tree species. But now we're kind of moved that in and with IPM is kind of to promote that healthy ecosystem um, and sustainability. Minimizing um, impact on the environment was one of those early IPM I already mentioned, the human health, um, looking long term. That's one thing that IPM absolutely is, is looking long term pest management. Excuse me. It's not just today. It's not just tomorrow but adding biological, adding, you know, beneficials is a long-term pest management. You might not necessarily see those results tomorrow, today or tomorrow, um, but a year from now, two years from now, they're really going to make strides and, and really make, make a difference. And then just prevention of pesticide resistance. I mentioned in 1947 was the first DDT uh, pesticide resistance that we saw. Um, really thinking about that, um, and how that has evolved. And majority of the pesticides we use today, um, there is some resistance with different pests. So it's important um, to consider this, to use rotations um, if you decide to use pesticides and use different pesticides and also think of softer pesticides, pesticides that affect the environment, human health risks even a little bit less. And then economic is always really important. And you know, it's that big, big kind of thing everything we do is based on economics. Um, my experience, you know, in the landscape um, and turf industry is that a lot of times they don't see that initial benefit economically. Um, majority of landscapers, unfortunately, have not moved to IPM and it, it is because of cost. Um, but the, looking at the long term, there is some dividends that that do make returns um, and savings long term with reduction in pesticides um, and how that goes into their overhead and uh, ultimately their budget. So today we're going to talk about, you know, several different concepts, um, you know, the cultural, mechanical, biological, and then also chemical. All these things go into IPM. 
um, there, you know, it's as you commonly see a triangle, you know, and you kind of move down, you know, your cultural up near the top, your mechanical, your biological, and kind of your last case scenario, your chemical. But all these tools are very important in IPM. Um, you got to use these multiple tactics to reduce pests um, and ultimately prom promote plant health. Um, and thresholds, which we'll talk about, are very important because it's different for everybody. Thresholds are expectations. Um, some, I mean, it doesn't matter how much you talk to them, some homeowners, and when talking to lawn, th there is, there's no uh, threshold um, that all clover, white clover in the lawn has to be removed. It, it's unacceptable to them. And yes, you know, we need to be better advocates and say, you know, there's nothing wrong with 10, 15, even 50% clover. When you think of, you know, the benefits and, and pollinators, um, clover goes a long way and it, and it thrives in that low maintenance situation, which we'll talk about. Um, and just being out there, being aware of what's going on in the environment, being aware of what's going on in our crops and our landscape is the biggest thing. And we'll talk about some of those things moving forward. One thing I always like to start out with an IPM talk, uh, over the years, IPM has been kind of pulled and kind of, you know, used as, you know, how they feel, you know, would best in their best interest and worked on some school boards in Iowa that were trying to develop an IPM plan that didn't have pesticides in it. Um, pesticides are part of an IPM plan. They're obviously, you know, towards the bottom um, and, you know, they, but they're, they are a heavy component of IPM um, and hopefully through using IPM, we reduce and minimize uh, pesticide use and use softer pesticides that, that still get the job done. Now looking kind of towards the landscape, um, a few more slides and I'll kind of move into some pictures um, just kind of on the early, but you know, the biggest thing is planning ahead, um, knowing um, your crop, knowing the plants that you're planting, putting in them in a situation that they would succeed um, is some of your best preventative strategies. Um, and treat only if needed, only once re reaching that threshold. Um, seeing 10 aphids um, might kind of alert you, like, but at the same point, is 10 aphids really going to cause um, enough damage to warrant an application? Um, and thinking about that critically, thinking about that will ultimately limit your chemical applications. Um, it's always good to, you know, read and follow the label um, and really understand um, the different biology and the life cycle of that pest. Um, in some cases, treating, uh, when we go to kind of the weed standpoint, um, you have crabgrass completely throughout your garden, throughout, completely throughout your lawn. Um, Going out there in September, um, October and treating that crabgrass, you're gonna have very, very little success. Um, treating it early in that juvenile stage, even before um, it hits that three kind of leaflet stage, makes it a lot easier, reduces your amount of applications if you were gonna treat for it. So into that kind of goes the principles of IPM. Um, so a lot of these kind of words we've kind of already used there's a lot that goes into it, and a lot of them are ultimately related when it comes to the planting, the soil preparation. Um, those things on the front end make a huge difference in what kind of pests and how you control the pests on the back end. Um, as you're kind of maintaining, you, you know, the maintenance, your cultural controls, um, your monitoring, your biological controls, thinking of those things um, throughout the process and, you know, how much fertilizer you put influences a lot of different plant diseases. Um, so all those things kind of work through and work together um, and then kind of on the back end, um, your fail safe some, in some cases um, are your chemical controls. But all these different things work together um, over a course of a year kind of determine um, your IPM strategies and, and which way you're going to go. The biggest thing is being out there. Uh, and one thing I love working with master gardeners in the past. Um, because you guys are so on top of it, passionate about what you do, and you want to be outside, you want to learn, um, you're here for a reason, and, and, and you're out there, you're, you're dealing with these plants on a daily basis or, you know, a weekly basis. You're really passionate about it. You're looking for these pests, um, and the Master Gardener Program is great for that. It is telling you which species thrive here in North Carolina, 
um, you know, whether it's shade, you're looking at these different environmental um, environmental um, locations and different, you know, small little areas to what is going to thrive. Um, you're considering, you know, fertility, um, what the soil is like, running soil tests, using the resources available, um, and also on a cultural and maintenance during, you know, the fertility. The correct watering program goes a long way, um, especially in the reducing diseases and also weeds. Um, and kind of monitoring, and, and, you know, always, you know, coming from, you know, my, my background in turf, everybody wants a perfect lawn. But perfect, you know, is up for interpretation. You know, we need to reduce those expectations and allow for some weed species to allow, you know, for things that, that really do help the environment. Um, and then it's all ultimately about record keeping, uh, monitoring what's going on, writing it down, using past experiences and past issues to make decisions for the future. And the top one with, you know, with a whole bunch of ground ivy. Um, obviously not the optimal um, lawn situation. Ground ivy is a pretty um, bad problem. But, you know, with mowing, um, and I wish I would have added a picture, mowing, mowing hides a lot of those different things and also discourages. It's one of those cultural practices. But if you have a weed, you know, lawn full of weeds and you go out there and mow those weeds, are they still green? Yes. Are they still holding uh, the slope, they are. They're doing a lot of the same things that, that a turf would do. Um, or, you know, in the bottom there, a Christmas tree farm, you know, covered in weeds. Um, are those trees being impacted by those weeds? They are, without a doubt. They're fighting for nutrients. They're fighting for those same resources. They're fighting for light. Um, does that put added stress? It does in the same situation. Um, so sometimes weeds are okay, and it's dependent on the eye of the beholder. Those expectations are dependent on you and what IPM practices um, actually occur. And a lot of times it's different for every species. Um, clover, as I mentioned, some of the are okay. Um, henbit, some people love henbit this time of year um, in their lawns. I mean, it gives you a beautiful kind of a beautiful flower and some early uh, spring um, color, which is really a good thing. And so, but it's not going to be the same. And so you need to kind of balance that um, dependent on your uh, your crop, uh, your crop quality, and, and also the fruiting, and it just varies from um, location to location. The ultimate thing is on the front of it: the cultural um, proper management. You know, healthy plants can outcompete and withstand greater um, pest pressure. Um, a deep, healthy root system, um, access to nutrients, access to water, um, very little competition on the top. You know, um, for photosynthesis and light. Um, definitely aid that um, when it comes to weed pressure and then also combating uh, combating um, diseases and also insects. And a lot of times there's a lot of different stresses. There's so even abiotic stresses away from your biotic stresses. Um, your abiotic a lot of times blamed um, for pests, um, whether it's drought, you know, too much water, hot and cold. A lot of times what we see in the landscape has nothing to do with the pests. And a lot of times the pests are blamed um, for these different situations and, and being out there understanding what the plant's going through. Um, I like to say, you know, think about it like the plant's thinking. Um, if I go outside and I'm horribly, you know, it's absolutely miserable, it's 105 degrees, um, you're sweating like crazy, you don't want to be outside. Um, in most cases, the plant's in the same situation. Um, and so think about those different things and, and how they influence it. A lot of times pests are blamed um, for damage, even though there is a abiotic stressor that's really leaning towards um, some of that damage. Um, on the cultural side, there's a lot of different things. You know, I always recommend that culturally is one of the first things that, that you want to focus on. I always recommend, what am I doing culturally? Are you rotating crops? You know, planning location? Is there, get a little bit of morning shade? Um, you know, use the resources out there. Use the NC State does a great job in resistant and tolerant plants. Um, avoid susceptible plants. Um, you know, one thing I continue to see, um, and you know, one of actually a coworker has an issue with late blight um, tomatoes. Every year, hanging plants tried in the garden can't grow tomatoes, and she doesn't want to use many pesticides. So, but at the same point. 
this year, for instance, I've told her that I would grow more tomatoes and share with her if she focused on a couple other crops. So rotating those crops, you know, working with it, you know, she really wants tomatoes, but use your community um, and those different situations um, that, that kind of lend themselves together and working together um, is really what it's about. And just diversifying that plant selection, um, using a lot of different crops um, goes a long way into keeping plants healthy. Um, and just think about, you know, your maintenance as far as, you know, watering, fertilization, and Um, NC State, you know, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into um, the, these lists. I'm sure that you've used them quite extensively, and they're amazing. They're one of the best resources, telling you when you need to plant, um, and really focus in on genetics and selection for here in North Carolina. And it goes a long way in planting the right plant um, in the right location. And there's a lot of different tools, the mechanical and physical, that could help you. Um, and I always encourage, you know, if you're having a problem, you should try several of these mechanical and physical controls. You know, you might have more success with some, um, you know, depending on your situation, it might lean towards a couple more. Um, obviously, you know, the cost and, you know, the maintenance, you know, putting a barrier screen around, you know, a small ornamental tree. I mean, it works, um, but at the same point is a high, it is labor intensive with like a lot of these, um, and they might not be fit for your situation. Um, Always, you know, kind of trying to monitor for white traps. Put some traps out there, you know, for aphids. Um, really know what is in your garden at all times. And, you know, it's being out there. It's understanding what pests might cause issue um, and really doing some counts and, and, and thinking about it. And then also hand removal. Um, kind of back, you know, from the turf sense, you know, just reaching down and pulling out that single weed. You know, try to get to the bottom of it. Is it can you do it for weed infested lawn? Can you do it for um, the, the couple of the lawns I showed earlier? You could, um, but it's gonna, you know, take all day. Um, and it depending on the weed, you know, if you don't get, you know, the full root out, it will come back. Um, but not just turning to the, that pesticide right away and going out there and making a pesticide application, even if it's a spot treatment in just a couple locations. Um, reaching down, getting your hands dirty, that's, you know, what, what got me into this is I love to get my hands dirty. I love, you know, to be outside um, and really see what's going on with the plants and, and what, what is causing them grief and, and how, how to fix it. Doesn't make sense, as I mentioned. Um, and in, in some cases, whether you depending on the weed, you need to make sure you get out the entire reproductive structures. And kind of shift gears a little bit into biological and then we'll kind of move into um, some of the pests that we actually see here in North Carolina. Um, biologics um, becoming more and more um, adapted for North Carolina and more and more used. Um, an assassin bug up top with a, a potato beetle, um, they, they, they work so well in controlling. You know, your, the predators and parasites, you know, they all have this, they all, they're out there and being able to, most people that walk through a garden, most people, you know, walk through aren't looking for, you know, a lot of these predators, parasitoids, you know, that are out there in the environment and they're, they're here and we need to encourage them. Um, and thinking about what pesticides we use and how they influence makes a big deal. Um, when you think of some of the biggest um, pests that have kind of moved in, whether it's a spotted ring drosophila, SWD, or, you know, the lanternfly. In certain situations and overseas and, you know, as you look into Europe and, and even further in Asia, some of these pests are present. They have been for, for decades of the centuries, but they haven't exploded and haven't become invasive like they haven't once been introduced in the United States. And the biggest reason for that is because there's not many natural enemies. Um, here in the United States and other regions of the world there are that kind of keep them in the check. And that's why it's so important to kind of monitor what comes in and and because as you we've seen before it, from emerald dashboard to now the lantern fly um, and these different ones they have huge millions to billions of dollars of economic impact just with a single a single introduction of a new species um, so we really need to think about these different things and you know planning and 
really encouraging predators and parasitoids um, goes a long way um, on the biological controls. You know, the biggest, you know, drawback, you know, from uh, on the biological controls is that it takes time. It, it's not, you know, in the world we live in now where you could just find information, you, you get instant results with phones and different things. It, the beneficials, you know, in the biologics take some time, but in the long run, they're really going to play a huge role. Um, so using softer pesticides, you know, think about wildflowers, think about pollinators when they are out. Um, and then just, you know, a healthy garden um, and diverse goes a long way to creating an environment that's beneficial um, for, it, for, for beneficial insects. Um, are some of those same things going to bring in some, you know, past insects? They are. Um, so consider those different things um, and what you plant and when you plant it. And then, you know, just a small little, you know, picture here of, you know, parasitoid wasps and, you know, that process of how they ended up attacking, you know, and searching. The best thing about biologicals, they reproduce by themselves and they will go seek out that pest. Um, but they need to be in that right location and we need to have high enough, um, high enough populations to do that work for us. Um, but the more that we, you know, really focus on these, you know, parasitic wasps and focus on, you know, these predators and, and ensure that they're in healthy numbers, we'll reduce our pests in the future. And, you know, like I mentioned, self-reproduction, no pesticide residue um, from an environmental, no toxicity. Um, they're economical um, in the long run of it. You know, they evolve with the pest. They target and find the pest. Um, for you. Um, there's a lot of great things and a lot of research is going into finding more biologics. It's really the direction we are moving in the future. But, you know, it's not immediate. Um, but you got to think long term, which I, which is IPM. Um, you know, the challenge in the face of new invasives, you know, it, it, and figuring out what biologics will work does take, you know, even some more time before we even see it in the marketplace. Um, and you must tolerate some damage. You need to um, on the thresholds, you need to accept a little bit more damage with biologics and, you know, over time, those biologics and those controls are going to get better and better. And just chemical, um, kind of last thing we can, before we change gears is, you know, choosing the right pesticide, using softer pesticides, only applying when necessary. Um, and if you have to, make sure you alternate modes of action and aren't relying on the same pesticides, which can definitely transition into pest resistance. Uh, when you think of a lawn setting, going out there with a pesticide, spraying um, the weed, you're not, why is that weed there? You're not considering, um, it doesn't treat the underlying cultural problem. There's a re reason that that weed has outcompeted the turf, that has outcompeted your crop. What, it, what situation is leaning towards, you know, favoritism and allowing that to um, outcompete and, and dominate that space? Um, so it's a temporary fix. And a lot of times you got to know why that pest is there in the first place. But we have kind of came um, pretty far, full circle. Uh, we have moved to, you know, softer pesticides, um, got rid of, you know, and, and re removed from um, using your organophosphates, uh, your pyrethroids, even a little, um, still in that process. But we have definitely moved in um, to softer pesticides from botanicals, the soaps, the oils, um, and then even bacteria um, and microbes, um, and they're a lot more selective, short residual, more um, environmentally friendly. And so we have come a long way, but we still also have a long way to go in learning more about how to control pests moving forward. On your plant derived, your botanicals, I mean, register, you know, they're organic pesticides, um, but that will kind of, you know, your neem, uh, your evergreen, your pyrelin. Um, but with one thing, and just move into the first kind of poll question is, I mean, are these organically approved pesticides that are plant derived, plant based, are they safe for bees and other beneficials? So we'll take a minute here and um, let you guys kind of answer and we'll Quite a few coming in. Uh, let's see. Oh, 
I might have showed you the answer. Uh, so we got about 114 people in here. So about 60, 70 percent have voted. So um, the the number one answer. I mean, we got a lot wide range from you know 12 percent to 20 percent to 29 to 28. So everything received over 10 percent. Um, 38 percent of you um, did have um, the correct answer. Correct answer. Are they safe? They are not safe. Um, even organic approved pesticides aren't always safe for bees and beneficials. Um, when you look at spinocide, you know, some of your pantherins, your root known, they are dangerous for bees. And even some of your insecticide soaps, your horticulture oils, your neem oil, which wasn't kind of in the last question, but a lot of those products, if they're applied directly to blooming crops or during the day um, where bees frequently go, they can cause issues and they are dangerous for, for bees and other species. Um, you know, there are safer pesticides uh, avail uh, available, um, so, but you know, they do take some more time. You know, your garlic, your citrus oils, um, your pheromone tra uh, traps, your mating disruptors, those are much safer for bees. Um, so just because it says the word organic, um, and they're organically approved doesn't mean that they're safe for beneficials and bees. So be aware that just going out and spraying um, that spinocide, um, if you have bees out there, um, it is very, very dangerous for them. So you're going to have to think, you know, what crops are blooming, um, maybe apply um, a, kind of towards the end of the, you know, before we go into the nighttime hours in the evening or early in the morning. Think about these different things because just because it's organic approved doesn't mean they're safe for uh, for beneficials. Um, and there are other alternatives in this case, you know, um, putting borders, um, crop rotation, we talked about, you know, bagging fruit, it is highly labor intensive, but it does work. Um, and then resistant varieties, um, trap crops, um, and also sanitation. Um, IPM is a balance of all these different things. You know, we kind of covered a little bit on biological, a little bit on mechanical, um, and then cultural and chemical. You know, IPM is that thought process I think I mentioned before. It's that thought process and using all that experience, using everything in your toolbox and using the resources that you have to make an informed decision on the best course of action and use the pros and cons. And from one day to the next, that could change. Um, IPM is not a linear process. Um, it's, it's, it, and it changes. Um, a lot of people wanted to put IPM in a straight and narrow. This is what we need to do based on IPM. It's, it, it's nothing like that. It's, it is very adaptive. Um, another question, another poll. Um, what is the most problematic pest in the garden, garden or lawn? Birds, humans, Phytophthora, or aphids? All right, that should be pretty good. But 75% said humans, and I would 100% agree. You know, there is no, um, there's no, you know, numbers to, to support it. But when we think about all the things that you can do wrong, um, humans in most cases are by far. And now, you know, you in your garden, your site specific, it might be birds or it might be aphids, you know, based on what happened last year. Um, but humans over over the most part, and we'll talk about some of the different things that, that we do, um, cause a lot of the issues that we have in the garden and lawn. Um, and just poor plant selection, um, lack of site preparation, you know, improve and proper planning production. And we see it just, you know, from the cities that we live in um, to other homeowners, you know, you guys being in, um, being master gardeners, you know, you're coming to these, you know, trainings, trying to learn, you know, and that's the biggest thing that I love the master gardener program in is, is 
teaching and be having advocates across the state to help reduce um, humans' uh, mistakes in um, maintenance and also planting. Um, and just that, you know, whether going out and, you know, applying too much nitrogen and, you know, encouraging diseases, you know, trying to be advocates, trying to teach, trying to explain to do things correctly. Um, and a lot of times, you know, try to reduce our impact and, and ultimately what we cause. And so I mean, humans, without a doubt, um, and even just traveling around the city, how many, you know, trees do you see from homeowners and different people? We are advocates and, you know, the Master Gardener program is great um, at having people out there, you know, talk to your neighbors. You know, if you see them uh, just hacking up a tree with a mower, um, just, you know, and you might not convince them on the first time. Or it might take some, you know, a couple different neighbors coming to finally say, oh, oh, yeah, I mean, I never really thought about it. I just hurry up and cut my lawn. But it does make a huge thing. And it's creating a stress, which ultimately could lead to pests, um, ultimately lead to pests causing more damage. And, and just even that an additional pesticide that's completely unneeded um, if culturally, if um, we weren't causing a lot of the issues that we do. And there's a ton of different pests. You know, you have your common garden pests, you know, your aphids, your, your cabbage worm, your earworms, um, thrips, hornworm, white flies. There's a ton of different ones that we see in the garden and the landscape. Um, you know, one thing I always encourage is, you know, write down what you see. If you're out there working, you know, and you, and you really, you know, you're out there monitoring, write down, you know, use that record keeping of, of what you have. Um, as far as beneficials and also your pests. Um, if you see a leaf hopper, you know, write it down. You might not necessarily remember that you saw that leaf hopper a week from now, but writing it down, doing counts and being aware of, of what pests and what beneficials are in your garden at, ever, at throughout the year. Um, there's a lot of beneficials when your aphids, your lace wings, there's a lot. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I'm by no means an expert in all of them, maybe some of them and you know but you know as you see these pests kind of um take off in your garden you learn about them you know it's that learning experience if you get squash bugs you know what to look for next year um using that expertise using those numbers from past years when you started to see them um and then also just it, when you started to see them you know the life cycle how to treat for them how many of them caused how much damage Putting all that in and, and thinking about it and, you know, the next year will help solve that problem. Or maybe we need to change this up and have a different um, biological or cultural um, and how that influences numbers. Um, and a lot of times it is random. Um, when you talk about some of your army worms um, and, and your growth species and, and how it, they move up from the south, um, and it is random whether you, you might have damage or your neighbor might or, you know, the guy down the street. It, it is very spotty in some cases, um, but just being aware of what is out there. Um, worked with a golf course when I was in Iowa, and they were an Audubon certified golf course. And one of the best things they did was they had um, a board right up um, next to the practice putting green, and they asked, um, they asked everybody to kind of come in. And they asked everybody at the end of their round of golf to – just mention the different pests they saw out on the golf course, the different predators, um, and then also the different the birds that they saw. And they had pictures of every single one of them, and they just charted what everybody saw on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's absolutely amazing to see how much life, how many animals, um, and then also pests and beneficial insects that they seen throughout throughout the course of a day. And they would also kind of close the golf course at 7 p.m. at night, you know, before kind of in the evening and invite people out to see what they could find um, out on the golf course in native areas. Uh, it was really an amazing thing. And it's amazing that we live in, you know, all these different um, pests and insects are right around, right near us. So there's a lot of common vegetable insects, you know, whether it's your aphids, your hornworms, your squash bugs, um, your leaf hoppers, there's a lot. Um, there's no way we could be experts um, on all these until we get those experiences, um, you know, and, and really 
or an entom being an entomologist, but there's they occur on so many different vegetables, on so many different crops. Um, really experiencing them, you know, as they kind of, you know, you can do research on the front end, but there's nothing like, and that's what I love about it, being hands on, being out there, and actually seeing them um, is when you learn the most. Um, is when you see cucumber beetle out there in the field, and and then really kind of from there, kind of determine what did it do and then doing some research in the back end of it. You know, we're talking about a few of those. Um, aphids, you know, usually attack new growth. Um, you know, that de stunting, def uh, deformation, discoloration. Um, they are very small, obviously. Um, being able to be out there taking a look um, at your garden, taking a look at, you know, the landscape, um, you need to be actively out there looking for aphids to see them. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of, you know, aphids are one of the ones that there are a lot of options. You know, your insecticidal soaps um, that don't have much toxic residue for the environment um, or horticultural oils. Um, we do have a lot of options for aphids uh, on, the, on the softer kind of chemical side of things. Um, but also, you know, encouraging um, beneficials could go a long way too. Um, hornworms on, on tomatoes. Um, you know, the adults are nocturnal, you know, use those different, use those different cues to really realize that I need to maybe be out there kind of towards the night or early morning or late um, in the evening to, to kind of look, you know, you might see the damage, um, but you might never actually see the, the see the adults. Um, and so, you know, looking for the adults, but also looking for the larva. Um, obviously, you know, their color, you know, first time, you know, going out there and seeing a hornworm, I mean, you can't miss it. Um, um, it does blend in a little bit, but um, very uh, unique features. Um, you know, you can hand remove them. Um, you know, bird feeders. Um, you know, birds that eat, you know, adult moth. Um, you know, that could go a long way. Um, so the birds out there, you know, putting those bird feeders in, um, they remove a lot of your adult moths for your, your tomato horn worm. Um, so they kind of work together. One of those beneficials, you know, insecticide soaps also work pretty well. Um, but I, one thing I, you know, as I mentioned, it's all about being out there, getting your hands dirty and looking for these creatures because they really are out there on the pest and also on the beneficial side of things. Um, it's all about monitoring, you know, know your plant, you know, really study, you know, there's so much information out there with the internet, um, coming from university sources, you can do all so much research and know be and know so much and expertise on that plant before you ever put it in the ground when those pests were occur um, and then you get to see it live I mean it's an amazing process um, that we get to do that um, but we're not trying to remove pests we're working you know we're trying to you know minimize you know their damage but at all to, at the same point letting them um, uh, move freely throughout the environment and scouting um, we'll see if the video works this was you know Obviously this was a soybean field, but just being out there looking, you know, whether it's every two, one, two weeks, you know, every, it's every single day. Um, there's actually a little bit of video, uh, but Dominic Riesing, um, Riesing out on the coast, um, an entomologist does a uh, cotton, um, does things, just getting out there um, looking. Uh, we spent five minutes and then went through everything that was in, uh, everything in the back. Um, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you get to see so many different insects on the beneficials and on um, the pest side of it that are down in that crop um, until you actually do it. You know, you could spend 20 minutes on your, your hands and knees and only find a couple, but just certain things like scouting, certain things, getting out there, um, looking through uh, makes a big difference um, and very, very easy um, and very IPM based. Um, and blueberries, um, you know, inspecting. And the blueberries and, you know, we're becoming better and better at, at thresholds. And those thresholds are how much aphids would cause, you know, damage to your blueberry pests. And then when you should consider treatment. Um, you know, just seeing one aphid, there's no point to go out there and spray a pesticide. And, you know, the research and, and a lot of things to, to measure how much, um, how many of them does it actually cause to create an economical or a, um, a big decline in overall quality. So know what you have um, before you reach for the sprayer. Um, and so here's pictures of some tomatoes. The last picture is probably the most helpful. 
um, what tomato disease is pictured. Some of them are very easy. Um, some you've never seen before. Um, I actually enjoy the ones I've never seen before. Um, just because you get to do research and you know working a lot across a different couple crops. Let's go ahead and, and do a quick poll. I should have had the picture up along with the question, but um, hopefully you were able to get a kind of quick picture of it. So kind of Ryan, that slide before had several pictures. Were you referring to the last one that came the up last, or the last, the last, last, the the last one? one. Okay. Sorry. Should have kept that one picture. Apologize. The last picture. All right, that should be good. And so, majority of you saw that last picture, um, without a doubt, um, is blossom end rot. But there's so many different diseases of tomatoes. Being able to understand, you know, the different diseases um, and visually be able to pick up on it. But if you didn't know from that last picture that it was blossom end rot, um, there are resources, you know, obviously the plant insect disease clinic, you could send your sample in there. Um, they'd be happy to look it under a microscope, use those different identifying traits. Um, there is so many diseases, especially as you look at tomatoes, um, that can cause so much damage um, and really wipe out your crop. Um, being able to identify and look between the different diseases is very, very important. Um, and I should have copied that over, so I apologize um, that missed it the first time. Um, but when you think of blossom end rot, you think culturally, um, it kind of is it, without a doubt associated with calcium. Um, and so, you know, a lot of it depends on sometimes, you know, when you get in the rainy kind of weird kind of weather features, you know, sometimes it will show up. And just doing a soil test and knowing that, seeing if your soil test, you know, if you have a low pH, you know, maybe an option to kind of discourage the blossom end rot, you know, is adding lime and increasing the pH of that soil, which makes calcium more available, but it also adds um, that calcium breakdown um, with the lime. And then, or if your pH is up and it's, you know, but you're still kind of low um, in that calcium, um, gypsum might be a better option. And so IPM is really about considering all those different things um, to ultimately um, to solve the issue and, and see how it does. Um, planning for the future. Um, you know, we'd have about 10 minutes uh, or so. Um, and there are a lot of different plant options, um, you know, zero scapes, you know, limited, you know, using um, things that work well together um, that require, you know, a lot of, the, you know, using, you know, turf and then putting, you know, a zero scape next to it that requires no water. Um, it doesn't really work cohesively. So we have so many different options. Excuse me. And so really think about requirements of plants um, and, and how that works together because we do have so many different options. Um, and plus, you know, think about as a standpoint of um, IPM um, and pests, having a different, you know, different whole bunch of different crops makes a big difference. And then kind of transforming that prevention and the recognition, you know, where on the plant, you know, is it? Um, that record keeping, writing it down, what is being affected, you know, how significant is it? Um, is it just affecting one species or all of them? Are there any signs of abiotic? Um, and then evidence of disease. A lot of your diseases, a lot of your insects, there's a story there. They're, they tell you they're, that their activity and what's actually there. And then, you know, lastly, I mean, do you actually need um, treatment? So squash bugs, uh, you know, feed on cucurbits, also squash, obviously. Um, you know, that piercing, sucking mouth parts, you know, toxic saliva, um, you know, see some wilting black fo uh, foliage, you know, they're always not going to be present on that leaf and um, that curcurbit or that squash uh, when you go out there and look. But being able to recognize the damage, being able to um, really think about, you know, what is causing the issue, um, it makes a big, makes a big deal. Um, and there are some options, obviously, once, you know, difficult to kill large nymphs and adults. It, it gets harder. Catching it sooner, the better. Um, catching it in that juvenile stage. Um, thinking about sanitation. Um, removing the plant debris after harvest um, because those the, uh, the squash bugs overwinter as adults in the debris. Just allowing that to fall to the ground incorporated, that's a perfect situation um, for those overwintering, uh, overwintering adults and could lead to a bigger issue um, in the future in the next year. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, chemicals, even, you know, some of your plant-based ones, such as neem, um, that do quite well. Um, 
we'll quickly move through common landscape insects. Um, there's a lot of them and obviously not at all inclusive list, Japanese beetle, scales, spider mites, they're all around us. Um, as you see from Matt's pictures, which I mean, absolutely amazing. He, they're everywhere. Um, Matt, <laughs> Matt, I don't know how he gets the pictures of all of them, but he does a great job. Um, but just looking, uh, common insects problems, whether you see the clusters on the bark, um, or the stems, um, so, you know, the stippling of the leaves or the blotches or the tunneling, um, it, it, it's pretty amazing and that we're out here every, you know, out in the field and there's so many of these that, that we don't even get to see if we're not looking. Um, when you think of Japanese beetles, you know, as far as the, the grubs um, or the adults, the adults um, hit such a wide array um, uh, of different rose, apples, stone fruits. Your grubs, you know, got kind of on the, your turf systems and and other um, underground root systems. Um, understanding when those um, beetle life cycle, whether you see them, you know, in the grub stage, kind of in that spring time frame or in that fall, um, and then you know, kind of adults, you see t typically in that July to August um, when they're feeding on um, plant species. Um, but think about, you know, there's a lot of Japanese beetle traps out there. Do these traps could also lure in your insects to the plants? So placement makes a big, big huge importance. Um, and so think about those, you know, using traps, very IPM, but can your traps also lend to, hey, Japanese beetles, come over here and look what, what you can feed on. Um, and so that makes it, it makes it a little bit more difficult, just thinking about what you're doing, um, whether it's a azalea lace bug. Um, so they, you know, both helping um, stress plants, usually full sun. Um, quick control is important because it can. Um, you see that widespread stippling of the leaves. Um, and so being aware of what situations, um, and you know, we could focus on, you know, a whole bunch of, obviously not enough time to talk about every single one, but just learn as they kind of come um, and, you know, try to learn about what's, a, what's in your environment and what's possible. Um, some scale insects, um, we won't talk too much time and spend too much time on them. Um, but um, difficult to control and qualities. Gloomy scale right here on campus, you know, uh, red maple, sweet gums, you see it quite a bit. Um, you can see those scales right directly on the leaf. Um, we're gonna skip T scale for a time as I look in, it's 11 o'clock. Um, I'll finish up real quick. Uh, two spotted cider mites, you know, there's options available. Um, now obviously hot weather, um, going and applying a pesticide, imiclopred merit, um, you know, one of the neonicotinoids they could actually increase populations um, of two-spotted spider mites because you're removing some beneficials. Then on the disease, you know, your Phytophthora, um, which hits a lot of different species, um, prolonged periods of moisture could cause a big issue. Um, cure, and fungicides aren't necessarily your big cure. Um, so it's, it's very important to get out there, take a look at it, um, and think from the standpoint, here's so, you know, biologicals, here's cultural, um, and here's chemical options, um, just in case it gets to that situation. Um, so dogwood anthracnose is another one. Um, even with, um, uh, even with uh, fungicides, it's very, very difficult. And so a lot of different options. Um, and, you know, just trying to figure out and using it. And sometimes, you know, we start out, we have a beautiful landscape. It takes a lot of work. It's an amazing, you know, what you know it, and use their time i love to be outside and love to do these things too but taking pictures and doing ipm things takes a lot of time is it you know that that insect's only going to be there for a second or two you better get that shot and if you want to figure out what it is so you can do some re more research back in the house or or send it in and sometimes you just want to hide um and you know um ipm management of weeds i'm going to take about two more minutes i'm going to fly through this i apologize it was kind of shortened on the disease and the weed side of, of things um I just wanted to talk about a few, but these tell you a lot. Um, kind of do, we're gonna skip the poll, um, but clover, you know, a conversation whether it's a weed or not. Um, what does that white clover in that lawn indicate? Weeds really do talk to you. They tell you um, low nitrogen. Um, that, so that low nitrogen, that is speaking to you. Um, and so it, it's very, very um, important to use those cues. Um, goosegrass, usually dry compacted soils. And so if you modify the cultural practices, you won't see as much clover. You know, we won't get into whether, you know, it's a good thing or a bad thing with the clover. But, um, you know, I have no problems with, you know, clover throughout a lawn. I actually encourage it. Um, we don't need to control all weeds. 
Um, but just a, here's a, looking at different low nitrogen, excess nitrogen weeds um, throughout the landscape that are there for a reason and they're talking to you and this is showing you why they're actually thriving in this in the kind of the turf setting. So it's impossible to have a pest free garden. Um, quick ID is important. Know your plant, know your pest. Um, cultural practices can, you know, flare up pests as well as reduce pests. Um, and so keep plants healthy, um, prevent stress, um, and just, you know, healthy plants, right place, right environment. And practice IPM. You have the ability um, to, to help others. You might see a pest that nobody's seen before. Um, take pictures of it, do you, or you can learn as much and then, and then talk to others about it and really help out. Um, and that will create the sustainable landscape that we're thriving. Um, just everybody have, fly through these power to your mildew, you know, monitor all the different things that you see with it um, throughout the year, the leaf curl, the drop, you know, understand everything you know, can know about power to your mildew and your fungicides available. In this case, you know, improve vigor air circulation just removing a tree could really, really help. And so that here, um, I know we're flying through, um, I'm just trying to, I apologize, uh, ran a little over, um, is this could be a disease, um, or it could be an insect in a turf setting. Is it grubs? Is it, it looks like it's a cool season grass. We're gonna say it's tall fescue for purposes here in North Carolina, even though it looks like bluegrass, but is it uh, brown patch? Is it a disease or is it lack of water? You won't know until you get in there um, or see the presence of skunks, crows will kind of tell you. So you got to really look at it. Um, and then as far as open it up, very um, thing, look, we'll see what's in there and then act on it. Um, and a lot of different options as far as biologicals, chemicals, uh, cultural things that you could do, such as irrigation. So all these things work together in an IPM plan. Um, it's very, very important. Um, and and the biggest thing is your experience. Um, get out there um, and promote beneficials, choose the right pesticide. And if you need to, you could always lay down and hide. It's a lot um, and there's a lot of information, but that's also what makes it so much fun for me is because I learn something new every single day uh, when it comes to IPM and learning different crops on the turf um, and, and on the turf side of it, but also seeing all these different crops that are grown and all these different commodities um, hundreds of different commodities and learning about pests that affect, uh, that affect each one of them. So with that, I will take any questions. Um, we might have a few minutes for questions. Um, I did see it kind of looked at the group chat. They will be posted also in the whole presentation. Um, uh, and it will be put up, um, but I'll let Charlotte kind of take over and take any questions. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Yes, there's a lot of interest in your slides, so we will get those. Thank you for sharing them. We'll get them posted and um, distributed. Also, there was a lot of interest in the, the little chart you had that said got pests. Um, so that might be a resource that would be something we could talk about developing and um, distributing to master gardeners, uh, just showing some common pests in the pictures and it would be great to match them up with the beneficial insects that help control them as well. So let's definitely talk about uh, developing something along that line. No, without a doubt. And I have a whole bunch of stuff on my walls and everywhere just of, of different ID guides. Um, you can never have too much of those things to use as resources, but also, you know, the great people at NC State are always happy to help. And if we don't know the answer, we're going to figure out someone that does. All right. Thank you. So um, we really appreciate you joining us this morning and sharing all your knowledge and, um, and then especially offering to share the slides so people can study them um, and use them as a follow up. So I'm seeing in the chat lots of interest in, in uh, some of the, the pictures and things you had. All right, so I'll tell you, I'm gonna um, turn it over now to Mike and Matt. Um, and, and Ryan, again, thank you. And um, it's great having you as a resource and knowing you're available. Ryan will be one of our speakers at the Master Gardener College in June. So if you want to hear more, please sign up for his session and, um, and, and get registered for the Extension Master Gardener College. And I apologize for running a little bit over and compressing everything at the end. I thought I was good on time. Um, and then I looked at the clock and I was like, oh no. But if you do have questions, I would be, if, if you want to send them to Charlotte and she could compile them in, in the email, I would be happy to spend a little bit of time and go through that. But I know you got, we got other things to do. So I'll um, thank you very much for your time and 
and enjoy the rest of the talk. All right, thank you. So anyway, if you can stop sharing, that'll give uh, Matt and Mike the opportunity to share and, and give us some quick be on the lookout for, which is an important part of IPM is get out there and look out uh, what's going on in the garden. Okay, it looks like I'm gonna go up first. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. All right, let's see. All right, so I just have one slide today. Um, this is our bolo for insects. Be on the lookout for March and April. Uh, we will, of course, be uh, presenting another PPMP at the end of April. Um, but for now, um, Basically, uh, things are starting to wake up as we get these warm days uh, the, and continued warm days and lots of sunlight. Uh, lots of insects and other organisms are going to start becoming more active. Ooh. So I did, right after I talked about the, um, the ground nesting bees last time, uh, I actually saw some activity right afterward, uh, right around campus. And we're going to be seeing them for the next month or so. Uh, of course, things waking up. I got a stink bug uh, on my back when I was in my house, so they're they're waking up. Um, also, we're going to have flights of reticula termites uh, swarming. So these are termites that can be injurious to homes, uh, feeding on the wood and whatnot. But also, obviously, being uh, coming from outdoor wood uh, in the garden, in the in the woods, places like that. Uh, there will be foliage feeders beginning. So once the tender leaves start to come out of the trees, that'll be the time when things like fall cankerworm and other caterpillars and such will be feeding. Um, if you're digging in your soil, you might find white grubs. Uh, they're going to become more active now, becoming their final stages until May or June when they emerge as May beetles, June beetles, uh, Japanese beetles, and such. Um, the social wasps, like the paper wasps, are starting colonies, so they're going to be collecting paper, and you may see a few out there. Uh, you're also, of course, I've seen a lot of male carpenter bees out. The males have the yellow faces. They'll be guarding territories where there's uh, very nice wood for them to burrow into and uh, create their nesting sites. Uh, the females will then come out later uh, when they've had an established, uh, when they've when they've established territory and, and start making those galleries in the wood. Uh, scales are mating. Uh, I got actually some Japanese maple scales in recently where there was males emerging from pupae. And here um, you can see this uh, male soft scale mating with the female. That means then that the females will begin to start to lay eggs, bloat, become large, and you're going to start to see crawlers, which is the time to treat. And of course, there's cockroaches, slugs, spiders, lots of kind of solitary creatures and organisms are going to be active, running around, um, waking up, basically. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. Um, let's see. Hold on. Let me minimize. Let's see. Matt, just yesterday, the day before, I think I saw my first honeybee flying out and about. Is that possible? Uh, yes, yeah, I'm sure you can see them right now. Um, where am I? I'm trying to. Where's. Oh. I'm trying to minimize this screen, but it doesn't seem to be working. Um, yes, uh, you know, the bees are starting to wake up and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll start to be active. Um, you, there may be some bee mimicking uh, flies that are out starting, but uh, but yeah. All right. Um, so in the chat yeah, list, there was a yeah. quick question about yeah. carpenter bees. Any advice on carp on huh. what to do with carpenter bees? We get a lot of questions at the extension offices about that. There's nothing. There's a fact sheet. There is a fact sheet. There is a fact sheet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, uh, no wood. Keep your wood away. Uh, I don't know. It's it's really difficult. There's uh, um, plugging holes can just cause them to cause more holes. Um, pesticides are really difficult to apply, um, and even then are not super effective. You can put some traps out, but they're really not that effective either. 
and may actually invite more to come by. Um, it's really difficult. Um, and there are a few fact sheets out there, but uh, most don't have very satisfactory <laughs> answers, unfortunately, um, because they're just very difficult to, to keep from, from getting at your, the wood. Um, okay, uh -huh. any other questions? I'm, let's see, I'm trying to find, there we go, there's the chat. Okay. Question about snakes being active. I can say uh -huh. I've seen a couple of snakes active and, and when we get warm days, you know, they will be out. Um, the black snakes tend to be some of the earlier ones that are out and active. Um, so. Yes, so snakes will be waking up a little bit now from hibernations. Um, and yeah, on warmer days, you'll see them. But of course, yeah, they are very tied to the uh, temperature outside. If it's cool, they're not going to be as active. And even if they're out, they're not, they're going to be kind of sluggish and mm. not really reactive. Um, so. Okay. All, right. All right. Thank you. No problem. Yes. Let's see. Thank you, Matt. We got uh, Mike, did you have a, did you have some slides to share? So well, I let do me indeed. Stop I think I can, yeah, I think I can bop you off Matt. but I got yeah. it. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Let's see here. And I'm also going to try and do this in such a way that, um, try and share my, it's got to be an advanced tab here so I can share the computer sound, but that's sound only. I may have to do that at the end so we can do the music when we finish. But for right now, let's see if, oh, my screen just went black. There we go. And I'm going to look over my shoulder and see if Matt can see my full first slide here. We Looks see good it. from here. Yeah, very good. All right. <clears throat> Some of the things to be on the lookout for during the month of April, and starting with woody ornamentals, spot anthracnose of dogwood. That's not to be confused with the dogwood anthracnose that Ryan mentioned. This is one that's common across the state. We'll start out with these spots visible on the bracts. I saw a dogwood just the other day starting to, uh, the bracts starting to enlarge. And our weather now, our moisture especially, is going to be what's going to determine how much of this we have. I've seen years when it looked terrible and I've seen years or at least one year when you couldn't buy a spot. So be on the lookout for those. That's a fungus that later in the season can actually cause a leaf spot. Antimisporium leaf spot on Photinia and Indian hawthorn is something that we can see year round, but as people are getting out in the garden more, they're going to be seeing it. And the solution there is if you have Photinia, replace it with something else if it gets too bad. And the Indian hawthorns, there's quite a bit of difference in susceptibility among cultivars. So if you have a chance to look for the less susceptible, the more resistant ones at the time of transplant, that's a good thing to do. We'll be seeing our gymnosporangium rust on, on juniper. It's usually the quince rust that actually shows up earlier, and that's the photograph at the center bottom there, just a subtle swelling, but then those orange gelatinous masses come out, but not as long and horn-like as they are in the cedar apple rust pictured in the lower right corner. We'll be seeing both of those on our, on our um, Eastern red cedars and maybe a few other junipers and those spores produced there will be what will infect our apples and crab apples, <clears throat> excuse me, and in the case of the quince rust, the ornamental pears later on. Exhibicidium leaf gall of camellia, those large fleshy pale leaves that start to emerge, you can see it pictured in the lower left there. And I hadn't originally had boxwood blight on my bolo list for this early, but we got a couple samples in uh, this week or last, so that's already showing up. So we've talked about that several times in the program and it's something definitely to be on the lookout for. Continuing with the woody ornamentals, two root rots, not necessarily all that active yet in terms of infection, but the symptoms can show up any time of year when the tree or shrub is under stress after the roots have been compromised, both Phytophthora and Amalaria. You can see a picture there on the right with the two Leyland cypress, one of which had succumbed to Phytophthora root rot. You won't be able to tell just from the top symptoms which one you have, but of course they're gonna cause a general sort of decline in the tree. And I'm gonna show a, a quick comparison of those two diseases in a moment in terms of the hosts. 
Uh, canker and dieback diseases are different. You can often see a single branch affected, as you see in the lower uh, center of the screen, whereas another adjacent branch or subtending one is still completely green and turgid. Some of the common ones are Phomopsis canker on azalea, Botrysphere canker on a wide range of plants, but Rhododendron and Leyland are worth mentioning. And also we see a lot of ceridium canker just killing the leaf, or excuse me, the branch tips on Leyland cypress. Root knot nematodes, we may see some of the damage happening to those, especially uh, boxwoods and gardenias. And if you have a large holly tree where the top portion is starting to yellow, one of the things to look at is check the trunk for evidence of sap sunker injury. And you can see one picture of it there on the right hand side. We had last year in April three different Nellie R. Stevens hollies with sapsucker injury that were either, uh, I think some or all of them were just photographs, but that were brought to our attention in the one month of April last year. Real quickly, when we talk about the root rot diseases, the two big ones being Phytophthora and Armillaria and the woody ornamentals in the landscape, it's very variable in terms of which plants get what. So in boxwood, it's almost always Phytophthora, so much so that I wouldn't even put Armillaria on a bolo list for boxwoods. Azalea and rhododendron is still skewed toward the Phytophthora being the main one, even for Leyland. But once we get to Arborvitae and junipers, it's much more balanced. You have a fairly even chance of one or the other. Japanese holly, you get much more Armillaria than Phytophthora and much, much more black root rot than either of those, which I didn't put on the slide. And in the case of rose, we never see Phytophthora in the, in, um, in the landscape in homeowner roses, but it's actually our most common host to see our malaria root rot on. And finally, just some quick bolos for the other parts of the garden and the vegetables as things start going out, be aware of Pythium root rot and damping off. So avoid over overwatering too much moisture in those cases and also over fertilization which as Ryan mentioned sometimes we're the ones who do the most damage in our gardens. Peaches, there could be some peach leaf curls showing up pictured on the left and also you may not be aware but the brown rot fungus that causes our peaches to go into mushy masses and then turn into mummies that actually has a twig and blossom phase which will be starting to show up now in the coming month. Fire blight on pear. I didn't list apple, pear being more susceptible. I suspect that's the one where you'll first start seeing fire blight symptoms on. A couple of things in the flower beds, heterosporium leaf spot on iris and daylily leaf streak pictured on the right. You can see how the streak starts at the tip and moves downward along the midrib. That's characteristic of that particular disease. And you'll also notice in that same photograph, some daily leaf miners there. With turf, uh, so I know much about turf as you can fit in the period at the uh, end of a sentence, but fortunately I have a colleague here who is a turf expert known nationally and his uh, recommendations to watch out for in the coming months would include fairy ring on any turf as soil temperatures start to rise. We can see that especially if we have a wet spring and it can occur in any kind of turf. Cool season lawns, tall fescue for sure, may see some yellow patch during this time frame as well. That's caused by species of Rhizoctonia. And spring dead spot symptoms will start to appear as Bermuda grass and zoysia grass green up. This is actually an interesting case where the damage is done the previous year by the growth of the fungus, but the result is reduced susceptible or reduced resistance to cold and you get cold injury causing the dead spots and you realize it when they start to green up and the rest of the lawn. For more information about turf, you can consult the turf files website that the folks here maintain. So with that, I'll pull up the, uh, it's not letting me go and grab my chat box. So I'm just going to stop sharing then and now I can see the chat box here. Um, oh, someone said that they had brought both 
Oh, Sean, thanks. You uh, showed off the rust, so you're already seeing those. Uh, how to treat for the pick in the upper right. Rachel, I'm not sure what picture that was that you're talking about. Okay, with, uh, unless Rachel has a clarification there, let me jump down here. How can you tell the difference between sap, dumber, sap sucker damage and European hormone damage when the damage is old? That is a very good question. Um, I'm going to see if Matt can maybe tell us a little bit about characteristics of the hornet damage that would, that would give it away. So hornet damage is typically going to be done on, well, it's, it's typically vertical. Uh, they don't normally cut strips against the grain. They cut it with the grain. Um, now sapsucker damage is cause, uh, sapsuckers can cause different types of damage on different plants. Uh, typically in holly, we see them and some of the really thin bark uh, plants, you typically uh, see little squares or holes cut out in kind of a grid-like pattern. Uh, but I do have some camellia and a couple of other samples that we've gotten to have strips that are cut against the grain across from sap suckers. Uh, so again, typically the wasps are going to be cutting usually from dead wood, but they will sometimes use live bark. Um, but uh, strips uh, vertically. Looks like the next question is for you too, Matt. Okay, so that, does deer off sprays hurt any insects or soil? That, I don't know. I don't know what the active ingredient is in those. Um, I, I, I'd have to be, see what they, what they actually are. Do you know what the active ingredient is, by the way? Yeah, let me look it up real quick. So let's see, it is deer out. Tell you what, Matt, while you're checking on that. Do you mind if I share a couple of quick announcements and we can come back uh, for questions just so we can finish up for folks who need to, yeah. to be off by 1130? No problem. All right. Thank you. So Matt's going to uh, research that and we'll hang on a little bit after 1130, but I just wanted to close this out with a few announcements. And of course, the best way to keep up with things that are going on with the program statewide is to subscribe to our email list. Um, and um, many of you who are here now are subscribed. So please encourage those in your county to subscribe because we don't automatically add people. You do have to sign up and you will get announcements for things like the Master Gardener College, which is coming up in June. Um, registration has been open uh, now for a month and uh, it does close on April 15th. But if you uh, want to join us, I encourage you to go ahead and register. We've got some of our sessions getting near full and uh, we want to make sure you get, you know, the things that, that most interest you. But it'll be a great event and we will be celebrating the 40 year anniversary of the Master Gardener program in North Carolina. Also search for excellence. We're currently taking applications. So please nominate or submit some of those wonderful projects you have going on in your county where you're doing educational programs. Um, we're really focusing on things that happened during 2017, 2018. All the application and information is on NCSU Garden statewide site. So we'd love to see your applications. Um, and those uh, award prizes for Search for Excellence are uh, generated through the endowment. So your, your donations to the endowment help support um, Search for Excellence. And if we could get more income, right now that kind of takes everything that we get um, in the way of income from the endowment, but more income would allow us to do more um, to support program development statewide. So every donation helps. We do have an anniversary appeal this year and with a goal to raise $40,000 uh, for the year for our 40 year anniversary. Another way you can support that is to purchase a license plate. We still have some of the watering can versions uh, available. So if you like that watering can, go ahead and make the purchase because when they run out, it gets updated to our new logo with the NC State brick. 
We have a, a new portal uh, online that promotes the Master Gardener program to the public. So be sure to check it out, emgv.ces.ncsu.edu. Um, and so this is for anybody to learn about the Master Gardener program. It joins our suite of portals, um, like the gardening portal, the community garden portal, and the plant database, which if you have not visited lately, I encourage you, it's always growing, always evolving. So check out plants.ces.ncsu.edu to find great plants for your landscape. And just want to finish up with the handbook being on sale. This is a sale by UNC Press, so 40% off. So it's a wonderful deal that makes it $36 to anybody. And if you have an order over $75, you get free shipping. International Master Gardener Conference coming up in June, um, uh, just a few weeks after our state conference. So if you enjoy conferences, June is the month for you. Um, their registration also closing soon. So be sure to check that out. Also check out our Facebook posts from the recent trips to New Zealand and Costa Rica. They were both just amazing and wonderful pictures posted. Uh, and then you can see some of the plants and experiences we had. And if you're looking for another travel experience, there is a trip going to Tuscany, Italy this fall. And that information is posted on the EMGV portal as well as the gardening portal. And uh, you'll be getting an email about that soon. Our next Plants, Pests, and Pathogens will be April 23rd, and that will feature Matt and Mike again. So they will be telling us all about current pest and disease issues um, for the spring. So I look forward to seeing you then. And we are going to stop the recording.